Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Anand Narayan, and I'm the diversity officer of the MGH Radiology Department. I'd like to first start first start off our event. This is a virtual panel today here. We're confronting xenophobia and supporting our Asian community during COVID-19. And I really want to first start by thanking our leadership time that spent so much time working so hard in such a short period of time to put this event together. Carmen Alvarez, who's program director of diversity inclusion and radiology. Dr. Danya Day, who's co-chair of our diversity committee. Dr. Mark Succi, Dr. Efren Flores, Dr. Brink, and our marketing team, uh, Dana Jelp, Jessup, and Eleni Balasala, who worked so hard to put this event together. So first, I want to start with a brief overview of the program. We'll start off with remarks, uh, welcome remarks from Dr. Brink, who's the chair of our radiology department. We'll have a leadership perspective from Dr. Dr. Joe Betancourt, who's head of the MGH office for equity and inclusion. And then we're really fortunate here to have a really wonderful uh, panel here full of experts who first provide us with some local perspective on how xenophobia is affecting us here in our community at MGH. And then we'll have a national perspective on how this is playing out throughout the country. And then we'll also finish with a historical perspective on why. Then in our event, we'll start, we'll have a Q&A session. And after that, we'll close with some specific suggestions and recommendations for how you can make an impact and support your colleagues uh, who may be victims of hate and um, harassment. And this will be provided by Carmen Alvarez. So first, I want to introduce Dr. Brink. So Dr. Brink. Okay. <clears throat> so Thank you so much, uh, Anand. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> let me interrupt. But um, I know time is short, so let me just continue, if I may, and, um, and welcome all of our attendees, both from MGH and our health system at large, as well as uh, to all of the uh, registrants who may be joining us from afar. Um, I had the privilege of serving as the uh, co-chair of our hospital's diversity committee for about five years, and I was troubled by the what seemed to be rising incidents of hate-related uh, disturbances on our campus and uh, in our general community, and it seemed like these were increasing over the past few years for whatever reason, but certainly recently our uh, Asian American colleagues have been victims of racist attacks in the context of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm so pleased uh, that our department has partnered with the Center for Diversity and Inclusion as well as the Office of Equity and Inclusion to respond to events like this in real time, much like um, uh, we did with the Islamophobia event that we held after the Christchurch shooting uh, last year. When incidents of hate hit home, it's really important that we as a hospital community respond rapidly to support the victims of hatred. And with that, I'd like to now turn it over to Dr. Joe Betancourt, who is our Vice President for uh, Equity and Inclusion, as well as Joe also serves as the lead uh, responsible for equity in, in our COVID-19 response, both for our hospital as well as our health system. So with that, uh, Dr. Betancourt. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Jim. Really appreciate uh, you all giving me a couple of minutes here. I want to Congratulate you and your department and, and your entire team for taking a lead on this. Uh, really means a lot, and it's wonderful for us to be able to reaffirm our commitment to dignity, respect, uh, inclusion here and everywhere. Uh, as you all know, there's a lot going on as it relates to this pandemic, and clearly what research and data is telling us is, as we predicted, uh, this crisis is disproportionately impacting uh, vulnerable and minority communities. Uh, fortunately, we were able to stand up a whole series of work streams several weeks ago to address issues related to language and translation, uh, to really rally a multilingual uh, workforce, uh, to put together a multilingual repository of information, uh, to create a uh, text platform to reach our employees and patients who might not otherwise get information via our patient gateway or um, via our emails. Uh, we are uh, doing a whole bunch of different things, moving fast, knowing that every minute counts, uh, and that we are in the midst of trying to save as many lives as uh, we can. Uh, what this uh, session today uh, brings to light certainly is one uh, incredibly troubling and, and disappointing and frustrating and angering uh, aspect of uh, this crisis, which just has exacerbated it uh, even more. And we all know there's been national dialogue that has slandered uh, certain populations, particularly Asian Americans, as it relates to the evolution of this virus and this crisis, and unfortunately that's uh, trickled uh, right here to our community and certainly uh, across the nation. Uh, Asian and Asian Americans have certainly been forced to contend with not only the virus, but this climate of xenophobia has left them vulnerable to harassment and violence, and that's not just hypothesis, uh, that's proven by fact. When we think about MGH here, we know that our agents, Asian staff is about 11% of all uh, MGH employees 
uh, 18% of physicians, 24% of incoming residents, and 4% of nurses. We have a strong, vibrant uh, Asian American community here in all aspects of what we do. And uh, before this crisis started, we were squarely focused on uh, creating a mechanism to identify, report, handle any issues related to discrimination or discriminatory behavior uh, that was put on hold due to the crisis. Uh, but this gives us an opportunity to revisit that uh, with a very poignant set of examples that are relevant to today's time. Um, this event is uh, part of our larger Stand Against Racism, racism campaign uh, to help uh, stand up, speak out, and help end racism of all types. And again, our goal is to create a welcoming, respectful environment for all, including patients and staff. It's my pleasure now to introduce Elena Olson, who is director of our Center for Diversity and Inclusion, who will serve as moderator. Uh, and again, thank you all. Thank you, uh, Jim, Carmen, Anon, and the entire team in radiology for leading this, not only for MGH, but for partners. And I look forward to a discussion, but more importantly, I look forward to everybody taking actions to prevent this from happening uh, and uh, taking actions to support our colleagues. Thank you all so much. And Elena, I'll turn it over to you. Elena, I think you have to unmute. Sorry about that. I was unmuted completely and then I muted myself. So welcome everybody. Sorry about that. I was just saying um, thank you to everybody who's again organized and thank you for inviting the CDI to co-sponsor. Um, and thank you, Joe, um, also for everything that you're doing. It's been really a privilege to serve on the um, equity response team with you and uh, looking forward to, to forging ahead and all the wonderful things that we're doing during this really, really uh, sad and difficult time. Um, so the context for this, for this event, essentially, as you just heard this panel, is that we have six panelists with us here today. Uh, we have experts and we also have one personal story. Um, and in order to manage the flow of our panelists, what I'm going to do on this Zoom platform, and uh, by the way, this is the first time I've ever done this Zoom uh, webinar platform, um, is we're going to take a question uh, from each panelist. And as I ask the question, I will introduce the panelists um, individually. So I will not introduce them all at once. Um, and uh, I will ask you to please submit your Q&A. You will see at the bottom of your screen, you have a Q&A uh, button. Uh, please submit any questions you might have during the panelists' remarks. And what will ha be happening in the back end is that um, Anand and Carmen will be filtering the questions and feeding them to me. Um, so um, please, uh, please participate in this and we hope to get to as many questions as possible, um, leaving time for you to ask them and answer them. Um, and then after that, I am going to wrap up uh, the, the, the uh, panel and uh, turn the floor back over uh, to Anon. Uh, so thank you in advance uh, for your patience if anything happens here with the, the technical piece, and uh, I'll get started with the program. So uh, you just heard from our leadership of what, why we're here today. And uh, you know, we know that, that xenophobia and intolerance and, and um, anti-Asian sentiments are affecting us here in our own community. So what I wanted to do is start this panel discussion with our own local story. So we've invited Dr. Lucy Lee. She's a resident, um, uh, if you could go to Lucy's, yeah. She's a resident here in the Department of Anesthesia, Critical Care and Pain Medicine. Um, she is a resident, is working 80 hour work weeks each day. She's part of the clinical team here caring for our COVID positive patients. And unfortunately, she uh, personally experienced a very frightening anti-Asian incident here only a few weeks ago, uh, ago right outside of her hospital. So Lucy, um, it, it, I'm going to turn the floor over to you and maybe you could share with us what happened to you. Good afternoon everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, so this event occurred about two weeks ago. I was walking out of work around 3 p.m. So broad daylight, there were still a handful of people around um, milling about the entrance. Um, I'd actually just showered for the first time in the locker rooms because I was in the operating room doing aerosol generating procedures. Um, so my hair is wet and of course it was spring in Boston so it started snowing. Um, I pulled my hoodie over my head, started power walking towards um, the tea and the Whole Foods area. Um, I had just exited the entrance, was about to turn from Fruit Street onto Parkman when I saw a stranger, um, dark clothes, coat on, sort of coming towards me from across the street. Um, and I could hear him start saying some things, but it was a little bit muffled through my coat hood. And then gradually I was able to make out what he was saying, and he was screaming um, racial epithets, including, why are you Chinese people killing everyone? Um, what is wrong with you? Why the 
F word, um, are you doing this to us? And this continued um, in multiple variations of the curse words and racially charged slurs. And he followed me for about a block until he finally gave up and walked away. Um, so I continued, just kept walking really quickly, continued until I got outside of Whole Foods and then contacted police and security. Well, I'm really sorry, sorry this incident happened to you. Um, I'm wondering, um, can you just tell us uh, when you reported what happened after that? Yeah, so I called um, the phone number for police and security after Googling it on my phone, um, and then they sent somebody immediately to take an instant report um, about everything that happened, uh, a description of the person who said this, and they told me that they'd be in contact with me and that they would search all of the CCTV cameras around the area, um, since it was right by the entrance. Um, I texted my program director, he immediately called me, told the chair of our department who called me as well. And when I got home that day, I filed a safety report to make sure that this incident got to all the people it needed to get to. Thank you, thank you. And then one last thing, I just was, was curious, you know, when you told me about this incident and something that really struck me is, um, you know, how, how did this event make you feel personally? Yeah, so uh, I guess I'm lucky in that this is the first time this has ever happened to me. Um, I was terrified. He, the things that he was saying, the fact that he was following me, it was really scary and made me really sad um, and made me really angry because of the sheer irony that I had spent my day taking care of patients in the operating room and that I will be taking care of COVID patients um, and have been in the ICU. Um, so I was just very, very upset at the whole situation. Um, and I immediately, texted my uh, my residency class to tell them, hey, just FYI, you know, I know some of you guys are still at work. When you leave, please be vigilant and aware that this guy's around. Security is aware, but I want to make sure that everyone knows. And then um, I texted some people in the class above me and the class above me to also disseminate to their um, co-residents and make sure that everyone's notified. Um, and then after I filed the safety report, the QA um, committee in our department reached out to me and um, told everyone in the department about it at a, later, a department meeting later that week to make sure everybody was vigilant. Great, so you, re so you reported both to our campus police and security and to your quality um, safety reporting system. That, that's that's really, great. That's really great. So um, thank you so much for your courage and sharing this story with us. Um, you know, I know it's, it sounds like a really traumatic experience and I know that you also want people to know about this experience and you're gonna be writing up a, um, this experience uh, and submitting it to Slate. I know you mentioned that to me, so thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, at this point, I'm gonna turn our attention now to bring the discussion to a few um, national experts, uh, experts that have actually studied and have looked at the perspective on this issue on anti-Asian um, uh, bias across our country. So the first person who I'm going to call uh, to the panel um, uh, in this capacity is Manju Kulkarni. Um, so Ms. Kulkarni um, is uh, joining us here from the West Coast. Uh, she's the Executive Director um, and a of Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council, and she's a lecturer also in Asian American Studies in UCLA. Uh, with her collaborative partners, she's established the STOP, that's S-T-O-P, all in caps, A-A-P-I, HATE, so um, American Asian Pacific Islander HATE Online Recording Center uh, in March to record firsthand accounts of COVID-19 related bias against Asians across the country. And in just two weeks, the center has received over 1,100 reports of verbal harassment. So um, welcome, um, uh, Dr. Kulkarni. Um, I want to uh, just say, you know, new research is showing us that this type of incidents, you know, like Lucy's, is on the rise in our country. Uh, the article that we also shared in the weight room um, ex explained that as well. So um, I'm sure you're not surprised by Dr. Lee's story. And I'd like to ask you, what types of patterns are you seeing in the reports from your incident reporting center? Thank you, Elena, um, and thank you all for inviting me here today. Um, so this isn't surprising at all. Um, we began to see anti-Asian uh, incidents related to COVID-19 as early as um, the beginning of February. Um, before there were even uh, confirmed cases, uh, I can say here in Los Angeles, there was a child who was attacked uh, on a schoolyard by another child and accused of having the coronavirus simply because he was Asian American. He was then punched in the head 20 times. 
by this fellow student and suffered concussions and had to uh, go to the hospital. Um, since then, thousands of individuals have experienced um, anti-Asian American hate. And so we created the Stop AAPI Hate Reporting Center that you mentioned. Um, and uh, even as of today, which is now three weeks uh, since we launched the center, we've had almost 1,500 uh, incident reports. Um, and a number of these have actually come from medical professionals. Um, one uh, physician reported to us that um, uh, actually a coworker of his, who is also a physician, was actually punched in the parking lot of a hospital just after uh, they had um, uh, performed their duties. Uh, another physician reported that um, they received racist comments from a patient. In fact, a number of doctors uh, reported to our site those type of incidents. And a third mentioned um, that uh, he was on a receiving end of racist memes from hospital supervisors and administration. Uh, so these are all very concerning. I think uh, we have over 20 incident reports from physicians just in the last week or so. Additionally, a number of patients have reported uh, incidents related to um, either uh, their own doctors. One patient reported that her physician told her to stay, stay away from her community, uh, which is Asian American. Uh, another patient reported after going to see her pediatrician with her newborn baby, she was verbally attacked uh, and told uh, by two men that the border should be closed and Asian Americans shouldn't be allowed into the United States. Um, I do want to say that most of these incidents are not necessarily crimes. Uh, we're seeing a lot of verbal harassment, um, and most of them are not toward Chinese Americans. Um, so these are very concerning cases, and um, they're ones that we want to continue to encourage people to report to us. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, and thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Um, I'm now going to turn to another panelist, uh, Caitlin McMurtry. Um, she is a fourth year uh, PhD student in health policy at Harvard. Um, her paper, Discrimination in the United States, Experiences of Asian Americans, is based on a 2017 poll she helped design and analyze and appeared in the December 2019 issue of Health um, Services Research. So, um, you know, many of these incidents, um, so welcome, Caitlin. Um, many of these incidents tap into existing uh, racial biases and stereotypes that, you know, predate COVID-19. So you've conducted this important survey looking at, the, at some biases. Can you tell us a little bit more about your survey and what types of harassment and discrimination against Asians, um, uh, you know, have Asians been experiencing uh, well before this uh, pandemic broke out? Certainly, uh, thank you so much. Uh, to give everyone a bit of context, we interviewed a nationally representative sample of 500 Asian adults and 902 white adults across the United States over the phone from January 26th to April 9th, 2017. When we looked at Asians as a group compared to whites, we found that even after adjusting for major socio-demographic characteristics like age, education, and income, Asian Americans had, a, had much higher odds than whites of avoiding the doctor due to fear of racial discrimination and also reporting racial discrimination in housing. When we disaggregated these results across what I call heritage groups, we found that East Asians or those who identified as being of Chinese, Japanese, or Korean heritage and South Asians, those who identified as being of Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Indian, or Sri Lankan heritage, were more likely than Southeast Asians to report having ever experienced uh, institutional forms of racial discrimination compared to whites. In the context of our survey, institutional discrimination means experiences of discrimination in healthcare, in employment settings, in housing, education, and four other domains of everyday life. Additionally, South Asians in our survey were more likely to report having experienced microaggressions that is, they were more likely to report having experienced people making negative assumptions or insensitive or offensive comments about them because of their race. Overall, I wanna leave you with two important takeaways from our survey. First, 
Asian Americans experience discrimination and it affects the way that we interact with society in important ways. While Asians do not report experiences of discrimination at the levels that Latinx, Black, Native American, and American Indian folks do, and I want to call that out, we are nonetheless vulnerable. For example, again, we are more likely to avoid the doctor and healthcare settings due to fear of, of racial discrimination, a response that may be particularly devastating in this moment. Second, Asian Americans are not a monolith. Like Latinx, Asian is a broad term used to describe a wide array of people from a variety of ethnic groups, religions, and countries who speak different languages and even look different. As we found in 2017, and as COVID-19 is highlighting today, this diversity means that there are important experiences, um, differences in our experiences, and in our vulnerabilities to racial discrimination. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. McCurtry. Um, that was really, really valuable, and um, I'm really um, fortunate that you were able to share the information on your survey in particular. Um, I'm now going to move us along um, to uh, a historical perspective, uh, because we know that xenophobia and racism, especially during public health crises, uh, didn't start today. So we brought in two historians who actually study uh, this issue, and I'm going to start with Natalia Molina, um, joining us also from the West Coast. Uh, Dr. Molina is a professor of American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California at uh, USC. She's an award-winning historian and an author of Fit to be Citizens, Public Health and Race in Los Angeles. Her work examines the interconnectedness of race and ethnic communities through her concept of racial scripts. This looks at how practices, customs, and policies and laws are directed at one group and are readily available, and hence easily applied to other groups. So um, welcome, Dr. Molina. Uh, so my question to you is, you know, we just heard from, doc, uh, from Ms. Kulkarni and Ms. McMurtry uh, that xenophobia and racist stereotypes against Asians and Asian Americans are happening now, and they've been happening. Um, however, uh, as I said earlier, there is historical precedent. So can you tell us a little bit about your work on racial scripts and about other historical episodes in which Asians and Asian Americans are blamed for disease outbreaks and pandemics? Yes, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. This conversation is important, not just uh, for the here and now to protect uh, Asian American communities, uh, our health professionals, but we're also seeing the ways in which people are using this as a opportunity to push through their other agendas. Uh, for example, pundits talking about how Chinese students shouldn't be uh, studying in America because of the children of those who are trying to displace us. And I would argue that uh, this xenophobia that we're seeing today is so powerful because it's tapping into this longer history of racism, drawing on, on what I call racial scripts, the way we think about race, the way we imagine it, the stories we tell about it, the jokes we tell about it, uh, sort of like stereotypes, but also really pointing to the teeth it has, the way that it's not just about that moment in which we enact a racial stereotype, but it has this longevity because we, talk, we enact it into laws and policies. So for the Chinese community, we see this going back to when they first started immigrating in the mid uh, 19th century around the gold rush. And we see how they were discriminated against then, even at a time of when there wasn't crisis, right? They were charged more, a foreign miners tax. Uh, our first overreaching or overarching immigration act was the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, where we singled them out. Uh, even those that remained in the country and lived here, we had rules and laws about where they could work, where they could live, how many people they could live with, because we thought of them as being filthy and diseased, and even the air they breathed could contaminate us. So they enacted Cuban, cubic air ordinances. And so public health officials were very key in terms of painting them as what they called a the yellow peril. Uh, they saw them as unclean and unfit for citizenship. And they published these attitudes in their public health journals, uh, talking about how Chinese immigration is about the cause of the of decay of the nation and that they spread disease. And that's all before there's a crisis. So then when there is a crisis, such as the 1900 plague in San Francisco, the bubonic plague, it's Chinatown that's quarantined off, even though they're, they're skirting up against white businesses. The race serves as an 
organizing principle for understanding disease. So Chinatown is quarantined off. In Honolulu in 1899, they simply burned down the Chinatown there. And we see the same kind of thinking today. What I would also argue is that we are, yes, that we, are, we want to be allies to our Asian, Asian American communities, but this is something that affects us all. We should all see how we're invested in these. These racial scripts can never just be dismissed as incidental footnotes to history. Uh, this is why we start seeing in today's society the way that Zoom bombings are happening, at are happening at Shabbat services, the way that white supremacists are telling people who have COVID-19 to go into black, brown neighborhood, Jewish neighborhoods. Uh, so we need to understand how this in, we may have made so many medical and scientific advances in the 21st century, but we will still be hamstrung if we continue to use 19th century attitudes about race to understand COVID-19. Thank you so much, Dr. Molina, for that insight. I 100% agree uh, with that statement. Um, I'm gonna ask now um, our next historian, um, Dr. Um, Aram Alam, um, Dr. Lam is an assistant professor in the history of medicine at Harvard University, and she studies the history of medicine in the United States with an emphasis on translational migration, race, and health during the 20th century. So welcome, Dr. Alam. So my question for you is, how do these racial scripts that Dr. Molina just uh, talked about, how do they get activated in the current moment as we're seeing now with COVID-19? Thank you so much for this invitation. And Dr. Molina gives me a perfect lead in to thinking about this framing of COVID-19 as war. So a few days ago, the Surgeon General said that this week was going to be, and I quote, a Pearl Harbor and a 9-11 moment, unquote. And so interpreting this virus, which has no inherent political ideology, I think through this language of attacks on the United States is a dangerous equation and really has the potential to give license to this narrow nationalistic vision and the xenophobic responses. Because language is very powerful and the metaphors and the narratives that we use bring historical residues like Dr. Molina just told us about and they guide responses on every level, whether that's through policy or interpersonally or the way that we emotionally respond to these scenarios. And you know, many scholars have provided um, a lot of in-depth analysis of how this new iteration of war that emerged after World War II with the Pearl Harbor invocation and was reconfigured and expanded during the War on Terror. And they've called this this permanent war, total war, where everybody is on this kind of high alert status and always looking for possible risk and possible terror. So that this conception of war is no longer about a battlefield with a definitive start and end. It's this kind of permanent militarization that enrolls all of us in a continual project of risk, threat, and assessment. So we, this is exemplified in the if you see something, say something injunction, where all of us are asked to identify an enemy using some combination of history and fantasy and anxiety, and then to act on this in the name of security. So. In our present moment, I think with COVID-19, when the metaphor of war is explicitly activated as a disease, you know, the hospitals where many of you are at this moment, they're battlefields, the care workers are on the front lines, every patient is a soldier um, fighting against COVID, the civilian then is called to stand at attention and do this urgent search for an enemy. But this kind of war metaphor is tricky, I think, when it comes to the viral threat because the vigilant citizen who's asked to surveil the threat can become that very terror that they're enlisted to police. So we can all become the enemy and carry this foreign vector within. And so then this idea of risk is omnipresent, uncontainable, and possibly inside each and every one of us. And so I think what we're seeing is kind of this externalization of the unknowability and the anxiety that's getting channeled into these familiar racial tropes and scripts. So with COVID, it's really the resurrection of the diseased foreigner that Dr. Molina talked about in conjunction with this demand for a civilian vigilantism that's reignited this particular vision of xenophobia today that Dr. Lee experienced as she exited the hospital. 
Thank you so much. That was a very, very um, uh, clear explanation of, of the history. And I know we have such limited time with all of you. You all have so much wealth and information to share. So I do um, welcome questions again uh, that might have come from the uh, five panelists we just heard from. Um, I'm now going to turn my attention to our final panelist, uh, who is a psychiatrist here at Mass General, um, Justin Chen. Um, Justin Chen um, is the Medical Director of Ambulatory Psychiatry uh, Services at Mass General and the Executive Director of the MGH Center for Cross-Cultural Student Emotional Wellness. It's a nonprofit volunteer organization dedicated to understanding and promoting the mental health of students from diverse backgrounds. So, so thanks so much, Dr. Chen, for joining us. I can imagine that everything that we've heard thus far, from the, from the individual story of Dr. Lee to all these explanations and these, these threats and uh, these reports that we are hearing and all, and all the media that is, that is lambasting um, us, that this is taking a pretty big toll on especially the Asian community. And I just would like you to comment uh, in the time that you have uh, on you know, how the, the, the xenophobia and, um, is affecting the, um, the emotional well-being and how it's impacting um, Asians and Asian Americans, especially those working in healthcare in our front lines. Thank you. Of, uh, hateful verbal and physical attacks on people of Asian descent related to COVID in the news media. And this mirrors discourse from our own political leaders that attempts to pin blame on specific groups of people, um, as several of the other panelists have really nicely shared just now. Um, and we just heard about a very upsetting case right here in our hospital. Um, so to your point about healthcare workers, as we know, Asians are actually overrepresented in medicine relative to their population in the US. And so sometimes these attacks can feel even more jarring. Um, we might think, aren't we supposed to be the good guys? We're not like those other Asians, right? Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, this was recently mirrored in an op-ed by Andrew Yang, um, the recent presidential candidate, in which he implored Asians to embrace and show our Americanness in ways we never have before um, at this time. Um, his comments were widely criticized within the Asian American community for essentially putting the onus on an already vulnerable minority group to prove their Americanness in order to camouflage and protect themselves, rather than putting the onus on society and the systems and structures that we occupy to ensure the safety and respect of everyone, no matter their skin color or ethnic background. These types of comments also reinforce harmful stereotypes, on the one hand of Asians as perpetual foreigners, and on the other hand of the model minority that sort of um, does a good job all the time and doesn't make waves. Both of these stereotypes are harmful in, in their erasure of individual differences. So in addition to mental health resources, which are very important and which I'm gonna talk about in a second, I think it's crucial that all of us stand up against these types of incidents to, to promote mental health, uh, both in the moment by being an upstander rather than a bystander, um, as well as in the longer term by helping to change systems and structures. <clears throat> so in terms of how do you intervene in the moment, there's a lot of stuff online and I'm happy to share resources as well. Um, I took some cues from the American Friends Service Committee or in the Southern Poverty Law Center. But if you're seeing something like this happen, you can actually go and stand next to the person, you can talk to them and try to divert the attention away from the attacker. Uh, certainly notifying um, MGH police and security right here on campus or MBTA transit police if that's where you are. Uh, remember that you know, you're not just watching something happen. Verbal attacks can have similar effects as a physical attack. And so you can respond as though you would, as, as you would if you saw someone being physically attacked. Um, all of us, especially those of us in clinical or administrative leadership uh, positions, should be aware of hospital policies regarding respectful treatment of providers. For example, I don't know how many folks on this call know that the MGH Clinical Policy and Procedures Manual actually has a whole uh, statement about discriminatory, discriminatory requests or demands for specific types of healthcare providers by patients and families. And it stipulates that in general, these types of requests will not be accommodated and actually transfer of care may be appropriate in those situations. This policy was actually approved all the way back in 2017, but many folks may not know about it. Um, so just finally, in the last few minutes, I wanna talk about specifically promoting mental health after a racist incident. Again, resources do exist that we're happy to share. Um, Sanisha Dale, who was formerly part of our own Department of Psychiatry and now at the University of Miami, um, has published a little bit about cognitive behavioral therapy to assist individuals facing oppression um, that's available online. I also found a nice article by Monica Williams uh, from the University of Louisville 
who talks about um, kind of positive versus harmful coping strategies that African Americans often utilize uh, following racist attacks. And the positive ones tend to be things like seeking social support within one's own community, such as one's family, briefly, briefly limiting exposure to cues of racism, such as signing off of social media, uh, utilizing religious or other spiritual practices for comfort, uh, trying to distract oneself from cues of racism by trying to engage in pleasurable or relaxing activities. <clears throat> and also, of course, um, trying to convert some of those feelings into um, activism or other means of fighting injustice. This includes, I think, importantly, reporting these events, either nationally or to any local reporting systems or registries, similar to what we heard from Manju, and um, standing in solidarity with other oppressed groups when we're not the ones being attacked. Um, of course, importantly, I think talking to someone and if you can't shake it and it continues to affect you, do not hesitate to seek help, uh, preferably from a culturally sensitive provider if you can find one. Many of our MGH departments have diversity and inclusion groups that can be a great place to start. Our, our psychiatry department, for instance, has a wonderful center for diversity. I'm a proud member of it. It's run by Dr. Niha Trin, who's wonderfully supportive and would be happy to connect. And we're also in the midst of setting up urgent outpatient psychiatric and psychological availability right here in our hospital for MGH employees in the context of COVID. So don't hesitate to reach out uh, directly to me if you need anything and if we can help. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen, for sharing all that, an incredible wealth of information. And thank you so much for working so diligently on this topic, especially of uh, the impact that it has, you know, as you pointed out, um, emotional impact that it has on, on, on the victims. And in this instance, um, the Asian community. I'm glad you mentioned the policy. I actually was one of the, the folks that worked on, um, on doing that discriminatory request policy. And I think so many of us have been working on these issues for a long, long time. So thank you for sharing all that. I want to turn my final questions to all panelists. Um, Dr. Chen just shared some amazing resources and things that we could be doing uh, to um, address issues of xenophobia, um, especially during this um, era of COVID-19. Um, and, uh, you know, um, in my capacity, I get tons of emails and calls from our own employees asking, you know, what can I do? Xenophobia and racism is systemic. Like I'm just one person. And you just heard from Dr. Chen that there is individual things each of us can be doing. So um, I thought I'd turn it over to the rest of the panelists to see if you might have some suggestions, maybe just one very quick suggestion of what you what people can do. And I, I think if you don't mind, um, Dr. Um, Lee, Lucy, I think I might start with you because you did share with me something um, some of your colleagues did for you. So I wonder if you could share that. Uh, yeah, after I told, notified the residents about the incident, I had so many people who were reaching out to me personally, um, and that means a lot in this day and age when we're physically distanced and socially distanced from everyone. Um, it's more important than ever to check in with everyone, make sure they're doing okay, and to treat people with respect and empathy. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, that little check-in, it can really make a difference. Um, anybody else would like to share anything that hasn't been uh, said yet? Any of the panelists can just go ahead and chime in. Um, if I could add, um, Elena, yeah. you know, as I mentioned, we do encourage folks to report to our center. You can just Google stop AAPI hate. Um, and part of what we're doing um, is advocacy with local, state, and federal government officials to make sure that we have the right policies in place to address um, some of the xenophobia and racism because, um, you know, it's important that each of us act as upstanders, as just uh, Dr. Chen stated. But in addition to that, I think we need to all come together and find policy solutions um, for a number of these um, type of incidents because we can't really um, take it upon our individual shoulders to address them. And when it's as widespread as it is, uh, we really need um, solutions that work for all of us um, in America. And as the United States has a uh, quite a significant Asian American population, it's uh, something that's affecting uh, so many of us today. Right, and, and um, Dr. Kulkarni, if I could just um, kind of add on to that, you had also uh, mentioned when we conversed earlier that people underreport, right? It's like, we're hearing all those reports you're getting. This is just a fraction, right, of what's really, really happening. So would, would it be fair to say that you would encourage people to report? Absolutely. So we know that because of fears um, that immigrant communities have, uh, that Asian American communities have, and also the limited English profession 
proficiency of a number of individuals um, that they're not reporting and they're certainly not reporting to law enforcement. Uh, we hope that folks um, will come to us because we are a trusted source in uh, Asian American communities. We provide the form in uh, 10 different languages uh, and all of the information will be kept confidential. No identifying information is uh, provided to anyone without uh, explicit permission of the respondent. Great, great, great. Um, could I make one other comment, yeah, Elena? Sure. Uh, so, you know, the other reason that I'm not surprised by um, what Dr. Liu ex uh, Lee experienced is that actually women are report reporting twice as many incidents as men. And we do believe uh, not only for the past week, but in prior weeks, uh, this has hit women particularly hard. And um, so we are seeing a gender dynamic to um, the incidents that uh, folks are uh, experiencing right now. And so I just really wanted to add um, that particular element to it because um, people really um, don't necessarily think of the gendered component as much as they're thinking of the racial component. One other comment I do want to make is that um, as we are sheltered in place over much of the country, we are now seeing more incidents uh, uh, in those places where individuals are still allowed to go, which are grocery stores, pharmacies, um, uh, big box retail, and doctor's offices. So um, this, I think, brings that additional challenge to the lives of Asian Americans in the United States uh, who are just trying to li live their daily lives, who are trying to do the best that they can amidst uh, this virus. Um, because, you know, and, and I think it just also speaks to uh, what that challenge is, because if all you can do is go uh, to the grocery store and get some food, and yet that is where you're being attacked, or if you're going to the doctor's office for an urgent medical need and you are being physically or verbally assaulted, just imagine how it's even preventing folks from doing the things that they need to do because of the fears and anxieties uh, that they're experiencing. That's a very, very good point. Thank you so much, Dr. Kulkarni, for making that. Um, I'm actually now gonna turn the floor over to one of our own colleagues here at MGH, Dr. Ray Liu. He's also an interventional radiologist and the executive director of an international office here. So I believe that Ray, you're on the line. Make a Thank few you. comments. And, um, yeah, hopefully you can hear me right now. And uh, you know, I really just wanted to uh, thank this panel um, and uh, for, for sharing such interesting perspectives. And, and like Dr. Lee, I just really wanted to share for those who might not quite understand it sometimes, the, the personal evolution of what this means to someone of Asian American descent and I'm specifically a physician within MGH. And I would say uh, three months ago when this all started, it felt very abstract, right? And like others talking here, there's a, um, a sense of, you know, model minority, that this doesn't really affect me. I would read things in the papers on a national level um, that were shocking, but still, you know, not affecting me. UC Berkeley Health Services listed xenophobia as a normal reaction toward coronavirus outbreak, pretty, um, pretty crazy. The Royal Children's Hospital Australia saying, um, allowing parents to refuse doctors of Chinese descent to treat their kids, but still felt pretty abstract. I would say I live in Brookline though, and hearing um, you know stories even in Brookline, the smaller concentric circles are very powerful. Um, a close friend of mine was um, quite uh, honestly spit on just recently, actually, even in Brookline, you know, two miles away from um, our big hospitals, uh, shattered racial epithets. My nephew's kids and her, their friends live in Bergen County, New Jersey. That's 40% Asian. They actually were spit on as well too, and racial epithets were 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 put on. And from a personal journey, this gets small, this concentric circle, this bubble that we live in, that we think that we live in, gets smaller and smaller. And to the point that, honestly, um, Dr. Lee, I agree with you, very angry, but I think there's real fear in the community. I would say my own family, um, you know, is worried. Um, my wife actually wants to stay in quarantine and is worried about when the quarantine comes up, what will actually happen? So sort of that yin and yang of wanting to get out of quarantine. We have three kids. What happens when my four-year-old son um, uh, is sitting in a line and is, uh, is um, you know, attacked uh, unnecessarily. And so what I would say against that is the action items that some of the folks mentioned are so important and um, really want to reemphasize that you can be an active participant in interrupting this sort of activity. And, um, and we want everyone to be have safety and, um, and be safe and not do anything that doesn't feel right to them. But if you can speak up, that's so important. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for pointing that out. Being an interrupter, we hear that word a lot. And it was, it's really great that both Dr. Chen and yourself and others have explained to us what that really means uh, and how each one of us, this is, I'm just going to summarize a little bit here and then turn the floor back over to Anand, how each one of us plays a role here. This is not just about the Asian community, as, um, as Dr. Molina pointed out. This is about everybody. Everybody's impacted. Um, obviously, the Asian community is, is, is personally impacted, but all of us have something to lose by this xenophobia occurring. And so all of us can do something. Uh, we heard a lot about some mental health support. You're going to hear a little bit more at the end about some other things, about being an upstander, about checking in, checking in with people so important that are actually victimized. You probably know somebody. I just, just now Dr. Lubick mentioned his friend. Um, and uh, make sure that, um, that you use, utilize all these resources that we're sharing with you and continue this dialogue because the more we can speak about it, the more the information is out there, the more we understand the historical perspective, the more we understand this is not just an isolated incident. This, is, this all feeds, it's a national issue, it's a historical issue, and it's a local issue that every single one of us can do something about. So thank you so much to all of you, to all of you panelists uh, for taking the time from your really, really busy schedules to participate today. It's been really enlightening. I wish we had some more time to have some more discussion. Um, it, I, we could have a whole hour with each one of you. So it, it's really wonderful. And um, I especially wanna thank uh, Lucy again, um, you know, for being courageous and, and coming up and, and, and sharing your story. Um, I know you even said to me that you haven't even shared your story with some of your family members because you're concerned about their emotional well-being as well. So it, these are concerns that are so real to, to so many people and we really appreciate you bringing them to light to us. Um, and also I want to give my last shout out to all the healthcare workers who are watching this uh, uh, webinar today, uh, to Lucy, to Dr. Chen, uh, to Dr. Um, Lee, to everybody who is who is here watching as well for the, all the courageous work that you're doing every single day to um, address this pandemic in our own hospitals. Um, really, uh, you guys are amazing and we are very, very fortunate to have you here and, and help us keep everybody safe. So at this point, I'm gonna turn the floor over back to Anand. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Elena, for all of your incredible work over the last uh, week or so helping to put this panel together. Uh, it's been a very short amount of time, um, but um, I really appreciate all of your hard work on this. Uh, next, I wanna turn to, to conclude the program, some resources that we have available to us to address some of the questions that are popping up in the Q&A and also to um, provide some additional resources for support that uh, Dr. Chen mentioned as well too. Uh, here at MGH and through the partner system, we have several resources available to you. And uh, here the links to those resources are right here. So these are just some of the resources that are available to uh, provide support for yourself if you happen to be a victim of one of these attacks, but then also too to help provide support for um, colleagues who may also be victimized by this as well too. Um, one of the things in the partners thing is, uh, as some of the questions pop up asking specific about what you can do to intervene, but um, the partners website has a link to uh, some different ways in which you might be able to personally intervene if you happen to see any of these incidents happen. Um, so once again, I wanna close up by uh, expressing my sincere appreciation for the panel. I really appreciate all of your time and effort. And to all the attendees, thank you so much for your attention.